This video is brought to you by Nebula. When you think about Europe's most expensive cities, you probably think London, Paris, or a Scandinavian city like Oslo. But the most expensive European city to live in is, by quite some distance, actually the Irish capital of Dublin. In fact, Ireland has been suffering from a severe housing crisis for years now, leading to a dramatic rise in both house prices and rent. And over 60% of Irish people today cite housing as a key issue, compared to just around 10% across the EU as a whole. Now, this might come as a bit of a surprise to the average viewer, given that Ireland's economy has far outpaced others in the EU, and in 2023 was the richest country by GDP per capita, not only in the EU, but in the world. But Irish wages haven't grown at the same rate as its GDP, and have actually lagged behind housing costs for years now. So in this video, we're going to explain why this issue has been decades in the making, why it's gotten worse recently, and how it's affecting Irish politics. So what actually is the housing crisis? Well, when people talk about Ireland's housing crisis, they could either be talking about the increase in Irish house prices or the increase in Irish rents. When it comes to house prices, over the last decade, property prices in Ireland have more than doubled, increasing nationally by 127.5%. To put this number into perspective, we can look at the house price to income ratio. This compares the cost of the median home in a certain area with the median income in that area. Generally speaking, areas of affordable housing have a ratio around 3 or under, while severely unaffordable is considered to be 5 or higher. In 2013, the index rate for Dublin was at 3.7, which means the median house was 3.7 times more the average income. But this ratio has steadily increased since 2013 and shot up since 2019, reaching nearly 6 in 2021. And the situation is actually worse outside Dublin. Nationally, the median house in Ireland cost €370,000 at the end of 2022, 7.7 times the average income of €48,000. Now let's look at rent. A large proportion of the Irish are reliant on the private rental sector, which has also seen rising prices. In fact, from 2010 to 2023, rents increased by 100%, the third highest increase recorded anywhere in Europe, after Estonia and Latvia, and far beyond the EU average of under 25%. Today, the average rent in new tenancies stands at nearly €1,500. Even though there are laws in place to prevent landlords from raising rents above a certain threshold, they don't really work and they're not well enforced, with reports suggesting that more than a third of landlords actually ignore them. Now, obviously, the housing crisis has made life worse for ordinary Irish people, but it's also led to an increase in both poverty and homelessness, which has in fact been exasperated by Ireland's no-fault eviction policy, allowing landlords to evict tenants without having to give a reason. Unfortunately, things have gotten worse recently for three reasons. First, stagnant wage growth. Second, institutional investors. And third, a chronic lack of social housing. Let's start with wages. Whilst rents increased by 100% between 2012 and 2022, wages only increased by 27%. Now, even though Ireland's economy is booming, wages are stagnating and Ireland's GDP far surpasses the income of its actual citizens. And what this means is that most of the money made in Ireland isn't being evenly distributed among its own population. Astonishingly, wages are actually lower today than they were in 2009, according to OECD data. When we compare it to the EU, Ireland's annual wage growth rate in 2021 to 2022 falls just below the EU average. There are 18 countries ahead. This wage stagnation has particularly hit young people, and they're earning less in real terms than they did in the 90s and early 2000s. As a result, young people are finding it really hard to move out. Two thirds of Irish people aged 18 to 34 still live with their parents, a rate significantly higher than the European average of 42%. The second reason are institutional investors, which have become significant players in the Irish property market after the 2008 crisis. When property values dropped, these funds began buying up more properties. In 2013, the Irish government introduced a tax regime that exempts these funds from corporation tax on rental income, encouraging these funds to further invest in Irish property, which puts upward pressure on house prices. In 2022, 58% of all newly built homes in Greater Dublin were bought or developed by these funds. The third reason for the crisis is a chronic lack of social housing, which has historically played a crucial role as a stepping stone onto the housing ladder. While Ireland actually has more social housing than some other European countries, it's still not enough and the social housing waiting list has steadily increased for the past two decades, from 26,000 in 2002 to over 45,000 today. 
A lot of this has to do with a series of government programs that allow social housing tenants to buy their houses off the state at a discount, similar to the UK's right to buy scheme under Margaret Thatcher. By the early 1960s, people could get back almost 30% of the cost of a standard suburban house from the government. And in the 1980s, the government began to reduce the number of social housing developments being built. Today, roughly two thirds of Ireland's social housing has been sold into private ownership. The problem was exacerbated by Ireland's property crash. At the peak of the bubble, the construction sector accounted for 25% of GDP and 20% of all jobs. After the 2008 global financial crash, the bubble burst and the construction industry collapsed and the limited housing projects that were being built were abandoned. Successive governments since then have used post-crash austerity to completely abandon social housing development and the last affordable housing schemes were discontinued in 2011. Targets are set every year to build a certain amount of social housing, but either these targets are too low or they don't get met. Ireland's work setting housing crisis has interacted with Irish politics in two conspicuous ways. First, it's fueled some of the anti-immigrant sentiments we've seen in Ireland recently, because many Irish people feel migrants are putting more pressure on the housing and social housing markets, even though the primary cause of the housing crisis is undeniably bad government policies. This includes the government's most recent help to buy scheme, which, while it might help a handful of people, will ultimately just further inflate Irish house prices by putting more money in the market. Second, it's fueled the rise of Sinn Féin, who've made housing one of their key issues and are now polling well ahead of any other party. Now, for context, Sinn Féin are an Irish Republican party historically closely associated with the Irish Republican army. However, while the party is still in favour of reunification eventually, in the last few years they've shifted their focus to economic and cost of living issues, including bringing down housing costs, locking Ireland's pension age at 65, and increasing taxes only on people earning over €100,000 a year. If Shane Fiend do get in, they've promised to freeze rents, ban no-fault evictions, make it harder for landlords and institutional investors to buy Irish property, and build more social housing. But while these are all noble aspirations, international comparisons suggest housing bubbles are more difficult to deflate than governments would like to admit. And without a full-on crash, Ireland's housing crisis is unlikely to go away anytime soon. You've no doubt been following along with the news from Israel and Gaza, but if you want a better understanding to dive deeper into the history of the region, then you should check out Real Life Law's Long Hour documentary about the tensions and fighting between Israel and Gaza going back decades. It's a superb way to brush up on the history of this region, giving colour and context to what's happening right now. That video, by the way, is part of Real Life Law's Modern Conflict series, where they regularly run through major ongoing conflicts from Lebanon's civil war to everything going on in Myanmar and the Turkish-Kurdish conflict. It's an incredible series and it's exclusively available on our streaming service, Nebula. As you likely know, Nebula is the service we built with a bunch of our creator friends and is the home to tons of smart educational content. The best part is that by signing up, you not only get access to exclusive series like Modern Conflicts, China Actually from Polymatter, or the logistics of X from Wendover Productions, it also directly supports TLDR. That's because when you sign up, it contributes to the budgets of these big documentaries and helps us grow and expand our ambitions. So if you want to sign up, use the link below, because that not only supports us directly, but it also gets you a Nebula annual plan for 40% off. That's less than £2 a month, which is an incredibly good price for an independent streaming service, which not only supports creators, but also provides you with tons of ad-free and exclusive content. Thanks for your support and for backing Nebula.